squares and minis. Um, so the mini squares are, I mean, most obviously based on your Instagram prints. So within the application, you connect to your Instagram. You can choose however, however many, 20, 30 of your Instagram prints. And this is kind of the same as photo printing, right? But it's something different to the old style sort of rectangular prints that we're used to getting and bringing that Instagram edge to it. So we've got mini prints, mini squares here and the larger squares. And they come on like a nice card, a nice substrate that's not printed, printed printing paper or photography paper. So it feels more substantial. It's got a silk matte finish. It's, it's much, much nicer in terms of what actually ends up in, in your hand. Um, what we focus on is the experience for the user right the way from the minute they see our brand, which is PS. We may be rebranding the print studio um, to mobile print studio, but from the minute they see the brand and their awareness of our product, through their journey in the application and how easy it is to use and how it looks and how they can interact and engage with it, choosing the images that they want to pull down to create the product type that they want, so, and also obviously offering the type of products that people want. Um, Lee did ask me earlier how we differ to Moonpig or Photobox, and we want to be focused on sort of more high-end um, consumer printed products that are, you know, personalizable, um, and that's one, one of the angles we're really focusing on. I'll show you an example of that in, in a minute. So from that journey of the brand through to the product, how easy it is to use the application, again we're focusing on mobile, which means on the way here on the bus, if I wanted to get some prints delivered, I could do it within three or four minutes um, and have them on the way to my house within the next couple of days. We can use them as gifts or whatever else. Right the way through to, obviously the, the user doesn't see when we take all of that data and send it through to the print company, but the packaging of the brand and then you know time to delivery. So that when it turns up in your hand, it actually completes that experience. And what we want to do is create and deliver the products in a really nice keepsake box. So we're into the realms of packaging and how can we do branded packaging. So these large squares or small squares could turn up in, in a box that's used one of the prints that you submitted or a number of the prints that you've submitted to be printed on the outside of the box, for instance. So print on demand with packaging is huge at the moment as well in terms of 3D packaging. I can put a strip of substrate that's 3D packaging in a specification that, that we've defined, put it through the printer, you know, um, apply our branding across that packaging, or do anything with the content that you've submitted. So, I mean, that's a, it's a really nice idea, right? If you submit 20 Instagram prints, you get the prints and then you get a packet, and on the outside of the packet, it's mini squares of all of your own prints. The minute you open it up, you're like, oh, wow, that's, that's my prints, that's pretty cool. You've got that emotional and personal connection to that content. Um, so there's, there's tons and tons of stuff that we can do around this. We're initially looking at the small squares and the large squares. Um, we're also looking at Polaroid style prints in both these sizes. So they would be slightly extended with the white bottom. Um, and again, with our text on photo, you can obviously then customize the bottom bit. You can customize the image. You can customize the back. Um, and when I talk about customization, I'm not just talking text on photo because anything that you guys could think up or design is something that we can then apply to the end image. So we've been talking about borders and typography, but actually it's any shape, form, you know, we want to kind of stay away from the tackier side, but speech bubbles or whatever else it might be, um, or even, you know, illustrated designs that fit, can potentially fit well on top of a photo. Um, something we love that's very cool is fridge magnets. So um, these are a really nice, thick magnetic substrate. So they turn up and they're a bit weighty in your hand. They actually turn up in a large square. I don't know if any of you have come across Stickygram. It's very similar to what Stickygram are doing. Um, but we want to emulate that and also add the personalization touch here, which um, I've made a point of. So again, um, I can apply text on photo or whatever options I have that have been provided to me by whoever's developing the application or the, um, the interface. Um, these will turn up in a large square of nine smaller squares, perforated, so you can have them as one large piece, stick them to your fridge or anything magnetic, or tear them apart, and you've got nine really nice sort of 
cute small Instagram prints you can put on the fridge or any, anywhere metal. They're, they're really, really nice when you see them in context. And what a lot of this stuff is about is about what's that context? What's that, what's that vision of how people will be using these products? Um, we do get onto that in a minute, I think. Yeah, so mobile print studio vision. So even, even these are some, you know, not, not the best examples, but you can see here, someone's been using square prints in their coffee shop in the window. A guy here is using all of his Instagram prints in frames, which is something that we're also looking at doing. Here we've got um, a photo book with all of your prints, it can be from Facebook, Instagram, anywhere, your phone. And again, providing the tools. In the Postcard app, we provide lenses as well. So if you want to enhance that photograph, you can, um, you can do that. Here, someone's strung them up against uh, above their bed on pegs, which is really nice. Um, these here are two examples of posters that we can potentially do, which maybe suck in all of your friends' Facebook profile photos and create you a whole poster. Um, in the normal world, it would be, well, you can have this poster, and the squares are going to be this size. In our world, we want to say, well, you can have this poster, and you can have the squares any size you want. Why can we not calculate in the application how many photos you've chosen, and then optimally resize those onto that um, poster sheet? You know, that stuff is easy. Easy. Dion will kick me for saying that, but it's relatively easy to do these days, and again, gives people the ability and the choice and you know, the, the, the mechanism to do it themselves. Um, this is just another example of some using some Instagram prints. Um, for nice physical prints. Um, so there are people in the space already, of course. Um, Stickygram do magnets. They do some really nice stuff. Social Print Studio, based in San Francisco. They do some really nice products. Um, and then Lob, who run a print API, which I'll get onto a little bit more. Um, what else do I want to talk about there? Here we go. Um, so these are sort of some other product ideas that we've been playing with. Um, friends posters, it's the one I just talked about. Um, tear off calendar, 365 days of beautiful memories. If you have that many photographs in your, in your Instagram account, um, you have tear away calendar, um, Instagram wrapping paper, Imagine being able to suck out your friends or your brother or your sister's Instagram photos and use that as the wrapping paper for their birthday or for Christmas, whatever else it might be. So, I mean, we're only limited here by our imagination, really, in terms of what we can actually deliver. And then on top of that, our USP or our, you know, our unique selling point as a, as a product and as a business is not only that we can fulfill this directly from your mobile device, we have the partnerships in place to be able to send all of that content to someone who's going to print it and package it and put it in the post to the standards that we want it to, to actually be. Um, but ultimately all we're sending through is an image or a PDF file that then has the metadata in it that defines what substrate it should be printed on, you know, what finish, what type of laminate. Um, some of the printing technologies that our company have these days are, are com you know, insane. Like they can print laminates that feel, they can put laminate on top of stuff that feels like leather. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, they can print, I was talking about 3D printing a little bit. You know, they can print any type of 3D box. They can cut it in any type of way. They can print um, cardboard wine holders. You know, all of this type of stuff. So actually, obviously we don't want to go down that route. We're not going to be printing mugs and t-shirts and all of that kind of thing. We want to stay away from that and do the high-end stuff or the, the creative end stuff, as we like to, to call it, which is what can we think of that is of interest to people that they would like to create these, these products out, out of their, their images on their mobile device. Um, how does it all work? Who knows what an API is? Anyone? No? So an API is an application programming interface. So, so we get a little bit technical, because obviously if we have all of our, the content that we've created in the mobile device, so I've just spent 10 minutes creating my set of uh, fridge magnets. I've chosen nine photographs. Obviously, 
all of it, that's packaged into a PDF file. In that PDF file, it has all of the data around what is the size of the large square, what's the guttering or the borders between each of the smaller squares. So we're talking nine within the large square. Um, what's it going to have on the back of each square? How do I identify that as a product piece for its for on its own? How do I apply the address to that? How do I know which user account that came from so that it's tracked through the fulfillment process? So once I've done all of that on here and I've created my, for me, all I see is I choose my photos, um, or sorry, I choose the product, which is the magnets, I choose nine photographs, and then I customize them if I want to, and then I pay for it, and off it goes. In the background, we create this PDF file that has all of that information around that particular product, how it's going to look, the images that go on the top, as I said, or what's on the back, the address, how do we capture the address to then match it up and be able to send it to someone. So that comes back to the, the API. <clears throat> so we have a system here on our device, which then needs to essentially talk to the printer's system. So our printer is sat in Soho. They have a massive print warehouse there um, where they do all this on-demand stuff we need to be able to send that signal across the internet or that PDF file and connect with all of that information about what the product is into their system we haven't explained exactly what API is yet I'm gonna get on to it um, that's sort of the standard process we're also building in the background this API piece which means that it's like a layer and it allows two different systems to communicate with each other based on, in terms of the technical side, it's a, it's a common type of language, but it basically allows two systems to communicate. I will create an API that says, I can give you fridge magnets, and I can give you fridge magnets in a square this size, and I can give you fridge magnets that mean there's gonna be nine little squares inside it, and the borders will be this and this and this. So the whole specification for that fridge magnet piece I can then make available to you. Now you might be a developer in your bedroom, or you might be a company, or you might be an individual who just goes, oh, that's pretty cool. I've got a, I've got a product that allows people to create all this amazing content, which is, in this case, my example is Studio, which does allow people to create really cool content. And I want to allow this company to also print. So they can then connect into our API anyone in the world, based on what we offer in that API and based on the specification of how we've defined it. And then they can also offer on-demand print services. So it, it means, what have I put down here? Hugely flexible API offering personalized print on-demand products, business to business for businesses and developers worldwide. The API will provide a powerful and flexible feature set including a range of products of varying specifications personalization of these products, address verification, packaging options, delivery options, and potentially even delivery tracking. So that means we're not just on the consumer side in terms we can we have an application and you can log into the app and choose the products that you want and have them delivered to your door. We're also building this layer on top of our technology which allows all of these other companies, and this is how you scale market, allows all of these other companies to also offer all of these things. We can also extend that product range in the API, and it can be business leaflets for small to medium-sized businesses, it can be business cards, it can be all of these types of things, but again, really personalized um, and, and customizable for that, for that person. All they have to do is plug into that system, and behind the layer of our API, we already have the print partnerships, um, and all of that stuff will be fulfilled for them. Um, so that's very interesting uh, in terms of an offering for us. Uh, maybe not so much from the design perspective. Um, what else do we want to talk about? Is print dead is a question that Lee raised. Um, I think it's a very interesting question. I think the, um, the, the traditional printing industry has gone through a real evolution recently and as with a lot of industries that are being killed off by technology, Kodak is a good example, as everybody moved to having a camera phone rather than a phone. If you look at a mobile device, it's kind of systematically killing off lots of different types of industries as 
that functionality gets sucked in into the device itself, or you know what is essentially a personal computer, calculators, compact cameras, watches to a degree. You know all this stuff is now held in that one single device. Why do I need all of these other things? The big one at the moment is obviously money. How is a mobile device assisting us with payment mechanisms? So eventually, you know, will it will it kill off your wallet? Do I need to carry this around anymore, really? Or can I just carry, carry this around with me? Um, we talked a bit before I kicked off around um, the design changes in iOS. So skeuomorphic design used to be very much focused on um, real world objects. So when Apple first kicked off with a touch phone, nobody was particularly used to using touch interfaces. And we kind of needed to be educated in the design of that. So objects within the interface would look like real world objects. So a wallet might look a wallet app might look like a wallet, might have a leather effect, for instance. Um, but with the update of iOS 7, we've obviously very much moved away from that because we've all been educated and we all know how to use touch devices or touch interfaces. Um, we can now get much more flexible in how we design the functionality in these applications because we know that the minute I look at a touch device, I'm going to tap it, I'm going to swipe it, I'm going to pull, I'm going to see what it does, and it's our responsibility in creating these um, products to make that as intuitive as possible. So there is there are still um, gestures that people don't understand, and we were talking about a bit earlier. You know, a tap and hold that will then launch a menu, for instance. I don't know if any of you have seen Summerly app. That was his main sharing mechanism. So he showed articles, and then you tapped and you held. And then it would launch a menu that allowed you to share to Facebook, Twitter, whatever it was. Um, we're much more used to using these interfaces now, but there still has to be a lot of consideration around how it's laid out, how it looks, um, what the prompts are, what the animations are, um, to show me how to actually use the system. Um, and I mean, yeah, I used one example earlier of the, you know, the, the potential benefits and opportunities of this, this kind of technology, particularly applications on touch interfaces. I mean, obviously we'll do a lot of this on, on web as well, but um, my cousin's daughter was two years old when she watched her, her mum pick up her iPhone, tapped in the code, and then obviously closed it again. Her daughter picked up the iPad, recognized, remembered the pattern, tapped in the code and was able to log into her, her iPad. So I think with the, the, because it's a visual way to use and engage and to um, interface with these systems, there's so many opportunities around you know, how we design them, how we lay them out, how we make them um, intuitive, how we make them engaging to people, and the opportunities that they present. So. I mean, I think in summary, the opportunities around design are limitless. We can, we can pretty much print and come up with any product that we can imagine in our, in our own studio. Um, education for people is huge. I know that was a topic that was of interest here. Um, it's a big one because not everybody learns in the same way. I think our current um, educational system tries to teach everyone in the same way. And actually, you know, there, there are huge opportunities around giving means and uh, ways for children to learn or younger people to learn. Um, I'm very visual myself, so when I do all of this stuff, when we have a session on how to build an app, we don't just talk about it. I'm like, I'm on a whiteboard, I'm writing it down on paper. If someone's trying to explain something to me, I'm like, no, I, I don't get it. Like, write it down for me, show me. You know, we get sticks on paper and we try to you know, show animations and how things will flip around and how you know, all that stuff will work. Um, and I think, I think a lot of people are actually like that. They're very visual. You know, I've given you a lot of information today. I would have liked to have been able to show you. I think you, you, know, you can get more from actually seeing something. Particularly when you're trying to be creative and you've got an idea in your head and you're trying to get that across. Get the crayons out, get colors out, get paper out. Start you know, um, using them as a, as a mechanism to, to, to teach and, and get your your message across because it's much more effective than, than just talking. I think we all learn in that way a lot and obviously having a, a device 
um, through, through the schooling system, or whatever else it might be, that allows you to do that, um, could be very, very beneficial to a lot of people. It will come down to the design. You know, it will come down to how does it look, how is it laid out, you know, how am I actually going to use it um, as to where the, the benefits will be. Um, I'm slightly off topic and I was talking about print, the print industry and its evolution. So um, the company that we're partnered with were in a little bit of trouble, I think, around 2005. They'd been a traditional print company and you know they were doing the standard stuff, bulk this, bulk that from businesses. I want you to print all these marketing postcards for me or leaflets or business cards or whatever it might be. And all of that is heavy on labor. You know, it's heavy on what do you actually need? How is it actually going to be spec? How is it going to be laid out? You have to work all that out first. Get all that content, you know, very basic. Maybe chuck it onto a system and then have to manually take that print job, plug it into the machines, and then have to get it all off, cut it all. So, you know, there's no money in this stuff for guys um, unless they were doing large runs, you know, large runs of content. Um, one of the challenges we've had is trying to spec out the Instagram um, wrapping paper, for instance, and it's a good example of that. Because if we're only printing, I don't know, 10 a week, every time we want to print that 10, those 10 rolls, someone in the print room has to go and grab the print roll that's the wrapping paper, put it into the machine, connect it up, then take our print job, you know, put it into the system. So I'm just trying to get across how sort of those processes have, have worked to date. Now what's happened with technology, it means that we can, we can cut out a lot of those manual overheads. We can create content and we can set up the processes for those jobs, if you like, or requests or on-demand product requests to be sent into the print environment and just printed, printed on demand. Um, it also taps into users expecting and consumers expecting to have things the way that we want them, you know? Why do I have to choose my business cards in your, your template? You know, I, want, I want it exactly the way I want it. Here's my, here's my template, you should be able to fulfill it. And that's what the technologies are really making available, be it web technology or app technology or even API technology, adds another layer to these uh, print services where we can print on demand and we can get you know, those kind of volumes in the digital space that you know, will, will warrant actually doing much more, much more custom type products. Um, so I think it's a really exciting space going forward. Um, where we position the print studio in terms of market, we're not quite sure yet. Is it kind of tapping into the hipster revival around you know, vintage photographs and Instagram prints? Is it the um, mothers with babies market wanting to be able to print pictures of their children, which is a, you know, a huge, huge market for people like Photobox. That's mainly what they talk about in terms of who wants these types of products. I personally feel that we're making these products available to a wider audience than just mums who want to take pictures of their kids. And it goes back to actually what's, what's the vision and what can we, you know, how can we inspire people to think up new ways to not only create these products and give them the tools to create and personalize these products themselves the way that they want it, but also what can they, what can they use them for. Now a lot of this will come from user generated content. So as we actually build the system, we'll probably build a mechanism for people to feed back to us on what they're using this stuff for. You know, like show us how, you, how you're using it. And then it becomes inspiring for other people. Some of the best cases I've, I've seen are, you know, the, 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 the stairway in your house and people just creating a whole collage of these beautiful photographs, because every photograph looks beautiful now, <laughs> now we've got Instagram, um, and creating this whole collage up the wall, you know. Um, we're also looking at sort of more uh, innovative, I don't know if it's the right word, but new types of um, substrates in print. There's a really interesting one called Yupo Taco, which means octopus in Japanese. And it's very thin substrate. Again, you can print it, you know, print onto it whatever you would like, but it will actually stick to anything. So it will stick to the table, it will stick to this porous wall, 
it will stick to the windows and there's no residue, there's no glue. Um, so that's a very interesting um, type of product that we don't know what people would do with yet. It might be that you've got, I don't know, French doors in your house and you start to decorate them with lots of different photographs because you can stick these, these images to them. Um, it might be your bedroom, it might be, we just don't know. So there's lots of interesting new types of products coming through and you know, there's this huge opportunity to empower, I think is, is the right word, empower the users of the, of the application or the mobile print studio to be able to choose the products that they want, feedback to us on what they want, create them exactly the way that they want them um, and have them delivered directly to their, to their front door. So I've covered quite a lot um, and I know there's a lot of different perspectives in the room as well. There's graphic design, there's apps, there's um, a range of different types of backgrounds I think and I want to be sure that you guys get as much out of this as possible and I think we're going to run a Q&A session but yeah. it would be good to hear back to this point, kind of what you're hearing, um, what you want to know more about <coughs> um, based on your, your own interests I guess. Um, or just anything that I've, I've talked about to, so far. Okay. Thank you. I've got a question. So you think, in terms of print dead, or the revival of print, it's not dying, it's just taking a different way, a different way of printing, of thinking about how we use print and how we actually print things. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, I think so. I think um, it, it's, it's this, Previously, if I wanted to print something, if I was a business or an individual, I kind of, I go in and I get, you know, maybe a few options. I don't get a huge amount. I think now, because we have the technology on the print floor to print onto anything and cut it up in any way that you want, um, and all that is is a digital file that's sent to that system, whereas before it'd be like a template and, you know, you can only have this here, here your logo goes here and your name goes here and that kind of thing we can be much, much more flexible. So, particularly in the app space, every time you build in a mobile application, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a custom build, so there's, there's no guidelines. You get a blank canvas each time. So, if we have a template for a business card, for instance, there's no reason we can't give you complete control over it. So I think it's about giving control back to the individual and the business, and that's where the revival's coming from, because it's the technology that's enabling that, that sits in front of the actual the print side. Mm -hmm. The print side now has the technology to be able to fulfill on it. They don't just have to do large runs of continuous print jobs. Well, will this be the same in terms of producing magazines and books and stuff, or is it just like for these particular types of items? No, well, well as I said, I mean, it's, it's, it's anything you can think of, quite, quite literally. I mean, they have... Um, uh, we, we went for a tour of their facility a couple of weeks ago and it, it's literally astounding what they've got and how they can cut it up. They've got um, all types of different plastic substrates, they've got substrates that look like mirrors so you can you know, get a mirror printed that isn't glass but it's, it's that good that it looks, it looks like you're exactly looking in a mirror. Um, they've got boxes that they can print and then cut which will turn into characters like little Lego men. I mean it's it's literally boundless. And if we can come up with ideas, then they can pretty much fulfill on it. So they can print it, and then they have all of these machines now that can cut it as well, which is really, really interesting. So, sorry I don't have more examples for you, but like, it, it's, it, we were like kids in a, in a candy store because it, there were so many different types of things that, that, we, that we could use. Hi. Um, so, I'm just thinking, like, you think it's printing something when it's the user So like advertising print, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting one. It's such a broad range when you talk about advertising. So you, you can get print. Obviously, there's a decline in, in um, the, the magazine industry. You know, most magazines have been killed off 
to date, time out is now free. It used to cost you five pounds, you know, because they can't get people to buy it. It's all gone online. So when we talk about advertising, I think we're less talking about print advertising in this day and age. For us, it's something we definitely wouldn't consider in terms of, you know, marketing our products through an advert, you know, in a magazine or, or a paper, unless it was a really, really specific demographic and we knew that we were going to get, you know, I don't know, 60% conversion rate on those people that saw the advert that were coming in. All of the advertising stuff also goes to digital because where we spend our time as well, you know. There is still value, of course. Um, the, the evening standards um, and the metro you know, have huge readerships. But again, it's, you know, they're free and how much attention do you actually pay to any of the adverts? In, in, those, uh, in those papers. Um, we've, we've played around with lots of different types of advertising. The most recent advertising for apps is Facebook mobile ads. So we've just introduced this now. So we've been playing around with that and looking at what the, it's called a uh, cost per install, because it's actually a direct call to action when you see the, the advert in your feed, which is install the app. So you can install it directly from there. Um, but you know we have to pay. For, we'd have to pay for that, and it actually costs us money. For me, I think it's much more valuable to find channels to. I know we, you were talking more about print, but in terms of the product space, and ultimately we're always talking about getting a business out or an idea out or a new product out. It's much more valuable to find uh, to build your social community and engage them, get them interested in your product through social networks. Obviously. Twitter and Facebook, Twitter's very powerful in that space, people get very interested in, in what you're doing. Um, going out and talking about it is the best way, like actually getting in front of people and talking about what you're doing and they get a first hand feel, but obviously that's limited to, you know, you can't be doing that, that all of the time. Um, but it's it's finding ways to engage your consumer, engage your, your users and um, keep making it interesting for them, keep putting updates out and all that kind of thing in terms of getting a product out. I mean, print, advertising print will always be there, I'm sure, for the large companies, billboards, um, bus stops, all of, that, all, of that, all of that kind of thing. Yeah, that will always be there, I'm sure. But I mean, that's, we're a startup, right? We don't have a huge amount of money. That's for companies with you know, big budgets that they don't necessarily need to see the return on. They're, they're raising brand awareness a lot more. So I probably see print in those types of spaces as more yeah, getting in a brand app. Would be evolving as well, like billboards maybe thinking Say that again? Um, do you think that, that could evolve as well, like printing for Google like a three D maybe installation print thing? Yeah, for sure. Um, that they already do it. Have you have you ever seen any of the, the billboard installations just off Old Street Roundabout mm -hmm. that they used to do for Smell off ice and people like that, and they were like, they had the massive ball there yeah, yeah, they've done lots of stuff like that, which is really cool. It's not digital yet, eventually, it will be digital as well. You know, it'll be some sort of mashup of the print and some you know 3D object, and then maybe screen technology as well. Um, whether that is more interesting to people and you know, it makes more people want to go and buy that, it creates what, what this creates is a story, and that's what's interesting to me. It's like, what's, what's the story around this? Like, okay, Smirnoff did this campaign, they put this massive ball on the edge of you know, Old Street Roundabout, it looked really cool, got loads of attention. The value is not having it there, the value is in the story about it, and people start talking about it. And then, Especially when it got um, reasons. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe for the wrong reasons, sometimes. Um, but that's, that's the, the virality channel of you know, advertising and talking about stuff. It's, you know, create, creating, cool, creating cool videos, um, nice ideas. I don't know if any of you have seen Amelie, which is a French film. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So she steals her dad's gnome, she's really angry with him, and then she gives it to her friend who is an air stewardess, and the dad doesn't know who stole it. Gives it to her friend who's an air stewardess, and the air stewardess takes it all the way around the world, photographing the gnome in front of famous landmarks, and then sending the Polaroid prints back to the dad. So the dad's like getting all these Polaroid prints of his gnome that someone's stolen outside like the Eiffel Tower and um, all of these places. He's like, what the hell's going on? So for us to do something like that in the postcard space as a postcard app creates this whole, you know, interesting story or potentially viral campaign that is much more interesting and engaging to people than I'm just walking down the street and I see an ad or I'm 
know, reading a magazine about travel and there's a there's a postcard app in it, you know? So I mean it's not it's not dead in any way, shape, or form, but for us as a startup and particularly digitally focused, technology focused, app focused, um, we definitely look at you know more things around around that space. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. Which limit do you think that a mobile application can have in terms uh, of user's experience? Because you are planning to use it to create a book with thousands of pictures inside. How, you know, how many users would you have from your phone doing this job? So I, I can create nine magnets, it's every 10 minutes, but I'm not going to spend one hour making that from the phone. So yeah. Until which point do you think is benefit from the services of create photo books? So it's a really, really good question. So um, that's so someone I, I think as well in terms of someone can demand something, yeah. but you think you don't see the value of it. Yeah, it's a really good question. There's two parts. How yeah. far do I think mobile apps can yeah. go in terms of how effective or powerful they are for users and how would we, you know, create a product like that for a user which is you know, way too much maybe. Um, so the first one, do I think there are any limits on mobile applications? No. I think actually longer term, this is just my personal opinion, we will probably eventually do away with laptops and desktops altogether. Um, for instance, I can walk around with my mobile phone and you know there might be screens in here that I can just plug it into and I get a screen and a keyboard or some other technology where I can you know, interact with it and engage with it the way we used to with laptops and stuff. Because the only, the only barrier to that is the battery life. The power is there already, the processor, the memory, the storage. So the only thing that's stopping us, stopping this, replacing this, is the battery, pretty much. And the way, the way I interact it. Well, why, why can I not have some sort of infrared screen or you know, something projected on the wall or whichever coffee shop I go to? There could be screens there that I can just plug this into and I get you know, a keyboard projected onto the, onto the side. Like if I want to type, I can do that. Or if I want to touch and interact, you know, because we haven't even got into the realms of touch interfaces on larger devices. You know, I, I think Apple is something Apple are looking at, being able to touch these screens. It's happening in some of the Samsung laptops already. Um, Windows 8 is obviously a prime example of a laptop tablet conversion. Um, so in terms of how far do I think apps can go, I think they can go a very, very long way. I don't think we've, we've even got anywhere close to the peak of, of the ways that mobile applications are going to change our behavior. Not just our personal behavior, but also in business. Like They're huge for saving efficiencies on an enterprise level. Um, a good example of that is a friend of mine runs a enterprise apps company, which is a apps for businesses. And there was a company that had used to build um, all of the estates with lots of houses. And they'd have the plasterers, so they do this en masse. Now the plasterers, lots of different contractors, going out to each of these houses, plastering the rooms, and they'd have to come back and like fill out paper about what they did and where they were and all of this kind of thing. So he built an app system that allowed them to have an app on their phone. They turned up to the house that they needed to plaster. You know, they plastered the room they punched in, pump, punch in which room it was, how long they were there, hit send the invoice, and the invoice goes off. So saves huge efficiencies in time and cost, which is the things that always come down to more often than not in our lives, it's time and cost. We have less time than we ever did before, and if I can find a way to do something that's easier, cheaper, more quickly, then you know the limits are boundless, really. So I think it's, there's lots of potential there. In terms of how we would facilitate something like a, um, uh, a photo book with lots of different photos, that's in our experience and our creative thinking to come up with the solutions. So, I, you know, with an app, like I said, it's a blank canvas each time, or that piece of functionality can be developed and built and designed in any way that we can think of. So it's about how smart we can get. So immediately I could say, well, okay, if you want to create a photo book, I can either suck in every single album, I can suck in a whole album that you choose from Facebook, or with one button I can suck in all of your Instagram prints and then I can give you the functionality to be able to delete them or switch them out or you know, resize them or whatever else it might be. So all of those types of problems have solutions 
only limited by our, thi our thinking, if you like. And do you think the user will be uh, happy to, to do this kind of thing on mobile device with talking? Yeah? Well, um, because you can't have the functionality and then you can play it on the computer, which is like the screen side. Yeah. It's the right screen side for, to do this kind of job. Yeah. But I'm talking about the limitation of the mobile uh, size, but then you have the iPad, which is like bigger, but the smaller. So maybe you say, hey, I'm going to target that for iPad only. Yeah. Because I think, you know. So yeah. yeah, we could do it for iPad. So we're talking iPad as well, we're talking tablets as well. Um, it's a decision that you take as a business, it's not. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a decision that we would put out into the market before we developed it, okay. to be honest. But, I mean, my, my view is, you know, people use their desktops, maybe you guys are different. I obviously come from the professional space. People tend to use their um, laptops for work stuff these days, and that's pretty much it. Nobody has, you know, a computer room at home anymore where they get home and they will want to go in there and I want to sit in front of the computer and, you know, just remember to create a storybook. It's the kind of things that I want to go, oh yeah, I'd really like to have that, or that's a good present, or it's this. And that's the enabler, is actually, in my journey back from here to Soho, I can log into the application and go, oh, I forgot to get that present for my sister or my friend. Oh, it'd be nice if I could do this. Oh, I saw that, that's a good idea. And then within the app I can do it. In terms of how, how well that works on a mobile device for that number of photos, it's down to how we design it. You know, it's down to how we lay it out for the user, how we utilize effectively as much of the screen size that we have as possible. And that's always one of the biggest challenges on a mobile device, is utilizing the space that you have. We call it real estate. So like, you've got a limited amount of real estate to get an amount of information across to a person and give them the controls to do what they need to be able to do. You move on to an iPad and you have much more real estate. So that's why usually an iPad app will be a complete redesign, because why would you waste all that space? You know, you can design it and it would work really well for a photo book, of course, because it's much more visual and you can see it. Um, in terms of getting across what the products, the only way to really do it is you know, high-end product photography. So we're talking like, why am I going to choose a photo book when I don't know what the finish is going to turn up like, you know? So for us, that's our job to get that across to the consumer with, with high-end photography. So we do a lot of photography and studio shooting stuff as well. Cool. Any more questions? Yeah, I've got one. Yeah. Uh, how much A-B testing do you do per app? Um, so at the moment on the postcard app, we'd love to do more, of course. Um, it, we're, it's one of those challenging ones because it, it means not only to designing, which is time, to figure out how you want to test. Um, it's developing, so it's development time, and then it's design time as well. So you're essentially doing everything twice. Yeah. Um, but the data that you can get back can be really, really valuable. Um, we've got about, not a huge amount, five, five or six A-B tests in the app at the moment. Mm -hmm. So each person that gets the app will get a different version and a different variant of all these different yeah. tests. A more in-depth example is the payment screen. See if I can explain this. It always confuses me when I start talking about it. Um, the payment screen has two different layouts. One of them just shows, um, just allows you to enter the card details. And when I finish entering the card details, the screen slides across and then reveals to me the expiry date and the CVV, which is the only other information we need, really. So when we start, and the other one is, has everything laid out. So the card number. This, the, the expiry date, the CVV, and then postcode, I think. So we look at which one of those would convert better. When we talked about it, I was like, well, if you've only got the card number on there, on the screen, am I not going to get concerned as a user about security? I'm going to be like, so if I just enter my card, because I can't see what's off the screen right, yeah. until I fill it out. So before I've even started filling out the card number, because the minute I hit the last digit, then it changes and shows me the other two. So I was saying, as a user, I'm not going to even start entering my card details into that because it looks like it's the only field I can enter. And if it's the only field I enter and I give you my card number, can you then take a payment? You shouldn't be able to. So now I'm a bit scared. You know? So that's the kind of thinking we have to do, we have to do around it. Um, the guy who does the, who is our merchant who provides this functionality, he said, actually we found it converted much better than the other room because users don't think that less much about it. It's yeah. less information. It's less for me to do. 
by the time I've got to the end of entering my card details in, I've committed. So to fill out two more fields, okay, yeah, I'll just I'll do it and I'll, I'll continue. So it's those, it's like literally that level of psychology and thinking yeah. that goes into these these tests. Uh -huh. um, can't remember which one's completely better. <laughs> right, one more question. Was there any choice between like uh, when you were uh, when they were doing the app, different app, like Android or iPhone apps? Because uh, I know a lot of companies they always go first for an iPhone app because they know that there's uh, a lot more money in it. You know, that people tend to be more affluent when they're using iPhones. Yeah. Like, was was there any question, or was it straight away? Yeah, definitely Android app as well. Um, no, it's a really good question. Um, it's a much longer answer, uh, <laughs> as always with these things. Um, so, in terms of percentage of Android devices in the world versus iOS devices, Android is pretty much um, caught up, if not taken over, in a lot of territories. I think it's very close in the states. Um, I think the worldwide figure is actually Android is ahead, but the difference is that. On Android, it's such a broad spectrum of devices. So we're talking about Android devices from £10 right the way up to Android devices that will cost you £500, £600. So a lot of these devices may be in the hands of people that don't have a credit card, can't pay for a Play Store account. Um, a lot of them you know, could be in countries that don't necessarily have you know, uh, data and connectivity. So there's, there's all of these considerations. So when someone says, oh, you know, Android's taken over now, so that's the market you probably want to go into by percentage, it's not accurate. Now we look at the iOS market. In the Western world, we're very used to having iOS devices. We don't think we do, but we've got tons of money compared to most of the other countries in the world. So actually, um, the people that purchase and buy iOS devices are the people who are within a demographic that have disposable income. So if I'm going to build a postcard application, I would say, okay, I want you to spend maybe, I don't know, five pounds within a year you know, as one of our users. Then to start with, I hedge my bet probably still on iOS. Because I know, and I just, I kind of know from community, I'm not so much the data on this one, but I know that people still spend a lot more within the Apple ecosystem than they do within the Android ecosystem. Android users are generally more technical, so, you know, probably a split as well. They're more technical and they're the ones that just got the free upgrade. Um, but they're more technical and on the, on the surface, they seem to expect everything for free or they can get it for free much more easily. Because it's an open operating system, it's much easier to hack and crack and you know, find ways to get stuff without paying for it. So there seems to be a bit more of that mentality. So, I mean, the Play Store doesn't do anywhere anything. I don't know the figures, but it doesn't do anything close to the revenues that the, that the App Store pulls in, for instance. Um, saying that, people are asking for an Android version. So we've had a lot of requests for an Android version. Um, in terms of Apple and how all the costs work, it's, it, it's, it's quite interesting, I'll tell you quite quickly. So um, in-app purchase obviously would convert much better. So if we let a user click one button with an in-app purchase to pay for the postcard, then we'd have much better conversion rates, around 30%. Because we have to go through a credit card payment provider, we have to do that because it's based on Apple's guidelines that says any physical product can't be paid for through in-app purchase because there's tax implications and different geographies and all that stuff. They just don't want to deal with it. So we have to you know, connect through a, a merchant, a payment provider. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. It's probably not that interesting. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, cheers. Great. Just to close, so can I say the future of print is looking good? I'd say the future of print's looking pretty good. Yeah, the company that we print with have had 30% growth year on year for about the past four years. Uh, and they're very much trying to position themselves as the leaders in print on demand technologies, which from what I've seen, I see as the revival for the market. It's print on demand. This it's is the same model as video on demand, kind of thing. Yeah. To the same model as video on demand. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. No, I'm not sure on that one. Um, I think there's, you know, there's, there's huge growth there because again, we can we can customize and we can personalize and we can get it print the way we want it. The app world is. Um, 
giving us those same tools. We can have it the way that we want it, um, we can personalize, we can customize, and we're used to getting things the way that we want. And if it's not there, we can feedback and say, why can't I have this? And then you know, they'll, they'll build that in. So it'll allow a lot more creativity in this space, I think, in terms of what, what you can do on the app itself. And then you know, tie it up or tie it in with what, what they can deliver on the print side as well. Lovely. Thank you. Great. Thank you.